Hello and welcome to Always Take Notes. In this episode, we speak to Jonathan Shainin, who is the long read editor of The Guardian and previously the news editor of NewYorker.com. So The Long Read is The Guardian's uh, now, I think, four-year-old venture of running three uh, big, approximately 5,000 word stories weekly. We talked to Jonathan about his career, about the different ways uh, that British and American editors approach their work, uh, and about where the long read fits into the Guardian and the broader British journalistic ecosystem as well. It was a great conversation and we hope you enjoy it. Thank you for inviting us into this lovely office at um, The Guardian. And first of all, we want to ask you about your background and your entry into journalism. It's very funny. I was having a conversation with someone earlier this week. There was a Twitter meme going around where someone, the meme was like, tell a story about yourself as a child, like an anecdote about yourself as a child. Uh, And I was saying to someone that when I was a kid... I never had any interest in journalism, but after I became a journalist, I could remember that my family used to subscribe to an American magazine, well, it's not an American, I mean, the magazine called Sports Illustrated, mm-hmm. that you two obviously know about, mm-hmm. uh, which I now understand is sort of, you know, meant to be renowned for its kind of like long form writing. But when I was like 10 or 11, um, I used to refuse to let my mother throw the issues away because I liked to go back and reread the long stories, which I thought, I guess, were really fun or really good or something. Mm-hmm. It was quite a nerdy story. So I, I went to uni and I wasn't interested in journalism. And I moved to New York sort of thinking I would take some time to go do a job for a bit before going to graduate school. And I studied film at university and philosophy. And um, I had a roommate who was a projectionist at a movie theater that we both worked at. This sounds like the beginning of a rom com. Yeah. Is that a job that still exists? Yeah, 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 definitely. It's a big union in New York. Um, I used to live with these, they were experimental filmmakers <laughs> who, who also worked as projectionists at like an avant garde movie theater. What were the levels of like basic hygiene and domestication? It was a big loft. And it was, yeah, it was a bit messy, I guess, now that I think about it. They had sort of, they had moved, they had, like, built rooms in the I mean, it was very funny because it was in, like, a part of New York that now is, I think, probably quite nice, but then was really rather mm-hmm. dodgy. Um, and my, this guy, Brian, who I think is now a lawyer, actually, uh, <laughs> his then-girlfriend had been Christopher Hitchens's intern at The Nation magazine in New York, the previous summer or something like that and got to know that I was sort of had an interest in kind of magazines a little bit and and I used to read The Nation and I couldn't quite figure out what to do with myself so I applied for this internship The Nation has a kind of I don't know long standing internship program Um, and I did it I didn't get to work for Christopher Hitchens Um, I worked for Alex Coburn um, and I worked on the book section. I don't know, I just got really into it. And it was basically like, once I was into it, I couldn't stop, really. Um, And I got a job at a book publisher for a little while doing nonfiction. And how did you end up going abroad? Where did did India fit in? So, I was at The New Yorker, where I was a fact checker. And I Mm -hmm. suppose that's the kind of main, you know... So you've uh, gone from The Nation to The New Yorker? Gone from there. I went from The Nation to The New Yorker via books to The New Yorker. And how, how long at each? Uh, the Nation was like less than a year because it was an internship and then like a bit of kind of like admin work. Mm. And then um, I worked in publishing for a few years and then I worked for a year at the New York Review and then three years at the New Yorker. Mm-hmm. So at this point it's 2007 and I'm a New Yorker fact checker and in these days I used to write a bit and mostly I wrote about the Middle East. Mm-hmm. Um, so I wrote a lot of, well, I never wrote a lot of anything, but the main thing I wrote about was the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, and I wrote about also Israeli literature, for reasons that are hard to explain. <laughs> um, and I was working at The New Yorker, and I got an email from a, a guy who was starting up a newspaper, an English-language newspaper in Abu Dhabi, backed by the government of Abu Dhabi, but, you know, with promises of 
editorial independence and so on and so forth. And someone had told this guy, okay, Jonathan Shannon is like a young editor in New York who is interested in culture. He's a young culture editor. He works at the New Yorker, which is probably what they wanted to hear. And he's interested in the Middle East. Mm. And so I moved to Abu Dhabi to start this newspaper. What was that, the that national. sort of decision making to go abroad? I mean, we talked to we talked to Patrick Kingsley mm. a little while ago for whom, you know, going from here took him off the sort of male leggings beat and onto, you know, the Middle East writ large. What was did you did you want to go abroad? Was it premeditated or I think once the idea came into my head I found it irresistible because I started to think, oh well, I'm gonna do something different from what everyone else is doing. Mm. But the, I mean the the a story that I think I've probably told before, that the time that all this happened, I was fact-checking a piece by David Remnick, mm. which was a profile of Gary Kasparov, because da- I was David's sort of designated Middle East fact-checker, and David's designated Russia fact-checker was a woman called Julia Yaffe. Could now, you just, just explain very yeah, briefly what a fact-checker what a fact is? Checker is yeah. the British audience may not be aware. Well, so, uh, so I think sometimes a mis... N- it's a sort of mistaken idea here that, oh, in America, everything is fact-checked, which mm. is not true. So, you know, American newspapers don't fact-check, and American book publishers don't necessarily fact-check. I don't really know the history of how it came to be a standard practice in the American magazine industry, but American glossy magazines, I mean, it started at The New Yorker, as far as I know, have always employed fact-checkers. And so The New Yorker has a staff of, in my day, it was 16 fact-checkers. Um, and everything in the magazine is put through fact-checking. Uh, so, you know, every week, the head of fact-checking, we all sit down and we go through, you know, what's the schedule for like the next two or three weeks, and pieces are handed out. Mm-hmm. Um, it's kind of on a, you know, you would sort of stick your hand up if you're interested in working on something, but there are some, the, the idea of the fact-checking department is that everyone is supposed to have kind of like some areas of expertise a little mm-hmm. bit. I was a rare, in my time at least, a rare fact checker who didn't speak any foreign languages, but I had this kind of expertise in the Middle East, mm-hmm. um, which I had edited a book about and I'd written about and I'd been there. And, was there know. an expectation you could move from that um, on to being a writer? Or well, or did you want to? Is that something you wanted? I, that's what I wanted to do at the time, yeah. So, so I think everyone who goes there wants to be a writer. Mm-hmm. When I started, so this is, I mean, I started at the New Yorker in 2004. When I started, part of the little sort of spiel that Peter Canby, the head of fact-checking, would give you after your interview mm. was he would say, you know, I want you to know this isn't like, you're not going to become a New Yorker writer. This is, you know, it's important for you to understand. And there were people who had been quite successful, but it was always a sort of sense of like, you'd be a fact-checker and then, you you know, you'd learn the craft and various things and then you would kind of go off mm-hmm. and you'd do your own work or, you know, the people I worked with who were doing, like, pretty serious stuff while we were fact-checkers. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a bit like going to journalism school or something. It's very much a sense of, like, you know, you'd know in J school that you had that, you know, like, some ambitious people who were, like, writing Village Voice cover stories. And there are exceptions, right? There are people who've gone from... Well, so, what has now happened is that the internet has transformed... So when I was there, the New Yorker website was, like, not a thing. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, there was a website it was run by one guy it would be like oh here's like a slideshow of pictures to do with one of the pieces in this week's issue kind of very minor stuff mm-hmm. when the website kind of started to expand in a really rapid way which I think is kind of I don't know, in the 2010s actually um, all of a sudden now there was a venue for when I, in my day when you were a fact checker your like highest ambition was to write a talk of the town piece mm. so these are the short kind of like you know I don't know it's a bet it's a, it's a fancier London uh, New York version of like the Londoner's Diary or something mm-hmm. uh, so you try to get a talk yeah, everyone we were like pitching talk pieces <laughs> so like I was like I did I like wrote a piece that never got published about a guy who was like a New Yorker who had moved to Atlanta and he had, like, reverse-engineered his, like, home kitchen so that he could, like, he had, like, hacked his oven so that his, like, Atlanta suburban kitchen oven could cook at, like, 900 degrees Fahrenheit because he was trying to reproduce this famous um, uptown New York pizza called Patsy's that's, like, cooked <laughs> in a coal oven. Um, anyway, never got published. Um, uh <laughs> So, in my day, that was the hope, and, and if you were successful and you got some pieces published, then you would become a writer. And one, Rafi Cacciadorian, who's now a New Yorker staff writer, was a fact-checker with me, 
Um, and Rafi was like quite advanced and wasn't doing talk pieces. He was doing like rather, you know, he had like a cover story in The Village Voice mm -hmm. about like American counterterrorism in Africa or something while we were all there fact checking. Mm -hmm. So that was the thing. Now, yeah, you do pieces for the web and some people, quite a few, I mean, have, have gone from, from the one to the other. But when I was there, it was a bit of a, fact checking was a sort of a thing in a way that I think the sense was that you shouldn't do it for too long. Mm. So, so is that what prompted your move? Well, so the story I was going to tell is that I was checking this Gary Kasparov piece because David's Russia fact checker, Julia, uh, who now is like a staff writer at The Atlantic, had left. Mm -hmm. And she grew up in Russia, speaks fluent Russian. So I had been asked to stand in and do this fact check. And I was in David's office one night. Uh, we were closing the piece, or it was near the end. And I, you know, we finished up whatever we had to talk about. And I said, look, can I ask you for some advice? And he said... Um, I said, you know, I've been offered this job in Abu Dhabi. They're going to hire me. They're going to hire my girlfriend. Think about moving there. And he said, um, well, are you going to check facts your whole life? And I was like, all right, well, i got to do it. Uh, so <laughs> he, was, yeah, he was like, go, go, you know. Um, so, and, but yeah, I think, I mean, to answer your question, Simon, I think that... Um, it was clear to me that like this was an opportunity to be the editor of something, mm. and that um, it wasn't entirely clear how long you would wait maybe to get that opportunity in New York. Mm. Um, I was going to ask. I mean, we we to talk to Patrick about the the route of, of going abroad as a writer and as yeah. a career there. But do you feel that as an editor, it offered a similar turbo charge? I guess so. I mean, I don't know. It 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 was one of these things where I think to me it was like okay, you have your, like, I think it's a British thing that people would say, you're sort of, like, train set to play with, but unless, you, unless it's good, no one will notice. So it's, in a way, it's very, like, there's a lot of pressure to it, I think, in a way. It's a bit like going abroad as a writer. I mean, you could stay in a newsroom and hope that, you know, over time you would be noticed and you're, you know, you would accrue maybe better and better assignments... Um, and if you go abroad, I think especially like as a young freelancer, it's it's kind of all or nothing. I mean, it's sort of I mean, whatever. Living in Abu Dhabi was a fascinating experience, mm. and I was well paid, and it wasn't like the, necessarily the best workplace. Um, How long were you there for? I was there for three, a little more than three years. Um, and the paper, I mean, it's a whole separate story. The paper, I think, was sort of on its way downhill by the time that I left. Um, but it was really fun, and it was th the thing that I was in charge of, which we called the review, was a kind of little proto long reads coom magazine that came in the newspaper on Fridays. Wasn't there a piece once written when this ceased production about how, like, at the time that American journalism was, you know, in this dire financial straits, suddenly there was just like this bright spark? Yeah, and it was this, Jonathan Shane and the National. Yeah, this, there was a piece to this effect that was written, and it was fun. I don't. I wasn't paying that much money. I mean, it was like a thing of like... But I do think it was like a lifeline for people who were sort of literary-minded freelancers who didn't have a lot of options for mm. serious places to do. I mean, it was like it, it was in a funny period where... So this is... We're looking at like end 2007 and for me until the end of 2010. And the newspaper actually launches in 2008. So you have the financial crash comes that summer. But I think the more, almost the more relevant thing, thinking about it from the perspective of today, is that there was the internet, but there wasn't really social media. Mm. So like I wasn't on Facebook. Facebook, I think, maybe had just barely come into existence. Um, Twitter started, I remember, shortly before I left Abu Dhabi, I think, or while I was there. So you had this sense that you didn't have this like proliferation of like web-based mm. publications. You didn't a magazine like the New Yorker wasn't running NewYorker.com. So if you were like a person who wanted to do something a bit more ambitious than like the occasional newspaper book review or or the kind of occasional uh, I don't know, you know, metro section feature for the New York Times or whatever. There wasn't really an outlet for you that was between like I'm writing a blog, and like, mm -hmm. I write for Harper's, mm -hmm. you know? And I think I filled in that spot for a lot of people, which is very funny to me because a thing I found, for example, when I moved to The Guardian, um, you know, five years later, was that all of my old writers were now like almost too big to, 
you know, I'd like ring up people who I used to work with and they're like, oh, sorry, I'm a staff writer at the New York Times Magazine now. <laughs> you know, I can, I can, I won't write for less than $3 a word, whatever, whatever. <laughs> so I, we, we always try and ask about money. So when you're at the National, what, what were yeah, you what was the rate? Well, so, we, so the, the, the base, the standard rate at the National was 75 cents a word. US was cents. my rate. It was US mm. cents when I, you would have to, I don't know what that would have been in pounds at the time. Which meant, and we did, so it was, it was a fun setup. It was like a little mini magazine. There was a cover story that was always 4,000 words. Mm-hmm. And oh, that was his weekly. Yeah, so kind of what it was in Fridays. So in Abu Dhabi, right? Friday is like the Saturday paper. Mm-hmm. So it was in, or uh, well, or in America, it would be the Sunday paper. But um, so there was a cover story that was always four thousand words, and it was like almost always reporting, um, but often uh, sometimes I guess were like essays, um, and it was very sort of Middle East themed. I don't think I sent you any of these links because a lot of them are dead now, but. Um, you know, like when the great Palestinian poet Mahmoud Darwish died, um, we got uh, Elias Khoury, who's this great sort of Lebanese novelist who wrote the sort of great novel about the Palestinian refugee experience, was friends with Darwish to write like a 4,500-word essay mm. um, that we translated from Arabic and published. Um, a lot of it, we did like a lot of reporting from Iraq, reporting from Afghanistan. Did you have a lot of um, freedom when you were sort of putting it together each week? Yeah, I mean, they, the only thing was like my bosses were like, "It's too weird." Who that was like? Paper? So it was. So it started. So the first, the initial editor was a guy called Martin Newland, who had been the editor in chief of the Daily Telegraph. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, it was Martin was like a great boss because he had come from the Telegraph with this idea that like what was really important to him in making the National was that it be seen as a quality broadsheet which to me meant nothing, of course, at the time. Um, but he really thought that, like, highbrow, serious kind of, like, culture, literary stuff was, like, essential to that. Mm-hmm. And I was able to kind of smuggle in my interest in sort of long-form reporting just separately um, because there, wasn't, there was a magazine, but it was more like, you know, a, a kind of Telegraph Stella or something like that. Mm-hmm. It was very, like, consumer, kind of poppy weekend magazine. Um, I'm trying to think of other pieces we did. I mean, it was super fun. It was like um, I sent a guy to Alaska to go to Sarah Palin's hometown, who was like a Harper's intern who I knew. Um, I to lose money for travel. Yeah, and it was well because in this case Martin, who very much had now what I now realize is like a Fleet Street instinct, was like, "Who is this Sarah Palin?" You know, this is 2008. <laughs> you know, she's just been discovered. Yeah. So it's like, Jonathan, get someone on a plane to Alaska. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, it was real. It was super fun. And then we so it was that. And then there was sort of like commentary on kind of Middle Eastern politics, mm. um, much like the sort of front of Talk of the Town in the New Yorker, the first piece, the notes and comments. And were you clear by now that you were an editor? Yeah. Well, it was only I think by the end of it that I was because I can remember now having conversation. I had a really long conversation with David Samuels, who was then kind of like my favorite writer, and he used to. This guy used to write for Harper as a New Yorker. He now, I think, helps run Tablet um, and still occasionally will do like a Times Magazine piece or something. Mm -hmm. Um, He had written a Harper's piece about going to Woodstock 99 that I read when I was in college and just like blew my mind. I don't, it's hard for me even to remember now what was so good about it, but I'm sure if I I went back and read it. um, So one of the things that was like, I mean, one of the things for me in this, when I had this job in Abu Dhabi was like, it was like, I must have been uh, 28, 29, and I knew all these people from New York because I'd, I'd worked at the New York Review of Books, mm-hmm. I'd been a fact checker at the New Yorker, and I basically commissioned all, you know, like all these New Yorker writers would do like occasional, not all of them, but like, you know, like two like obscure academic books about the Taliban. I got like Steve Cole to write a 2,000 word essay about. Um, Wendy Stevenson, who now writes for us here, you know, when her book about Iraq came out, uh, I like assigned it to George Packer. Mm. Um, I somehow managed to get Perry Anderson to review a book, which is like still one of my great commissioning accomplishments. <laughs> um, you know, and so I was working with like these writers who 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 had kind of been like my heroes a bit. It was super mm. fun. Um, but I remember having the conversation with David and saying to him, I was thinking of leaving, and I was like, I don't know what I should do. David Runyon. Uh, no, no, David Samuels, this this New Yorker writer, and he said, you know. Um, Look, you know, kid or something, you know, if, if, if you want to be a writer, that's great, but I think you're a pretty good editor, 
and like the world doesn't have a lot of good editors. So like, feel f- and he used the lovely example of Daniel Zaleski, who's an editor with the New Yorker, mm. who used to be David's editor, and said, you know, Zaleski's a writer, and David said to me, I hope this isn't talking out of school, you know, Zaleski's a good writer, but he's like one of the greatest editors, and it would be like a great loss to the world if he wasn't an editor. So mm. like, don't don't think that you're somehow taking this sort of path of least resistance or whatever to become an editor. Mm. So I think by the time I had done that for three years, I sort of thought, okay, well, maybe this is the thing that I'm good at. Um, I've always, writing has always been, like, almost impossible for me. Mm-hmm. Um, and... Uh, but you know what you like when you see it. I guess. I mean, I think I like... Yeah, it's funny. I don't have any problem rewriting other people's work. Mm. Um, I find that c- comes very easily, in a way, because I think it's not... It's I not as personal. It's, I think, yeah, maybe it's like a sort of mask kind of thing for me. Do you have a part of secret haikus in a drawer? No, no, and I've never tried to write fic... I mean, I, like, wrote poetry when I was, like, in high school or something and thought I was very literary, but, um... No, I mean, I, you know, I, um... I don't know whether this will be edifying or not for readers of the podcast, but, you know, I, like, sat down to write an essay about fake news ex- almost exactly a year ago, mm. and it's still not done. Um, <laughs> and it took me a, maybe a month, I mean, you know, bearing in mind I have a full-time job, I have to come to work, uh, to write, like, a first draft. And then David Wolf, who, previous guest of yours, who's my deputy, uh, read it and gave me some notes, and I started to revise, and then I just kind of, like, in June last year, I just sort of gave up. And I'm now, like, every week, I'm like, oh, yeah, i got to get back to that. <laughs> when does the India experience? Oh, so then, so, well, so once I, I mean, maybe you, this is a good point in terms of, I think I, if I had the sort of editing bug once I was in Abu Dhabi, I looked into going home and I interviewed for a couple of jobs that I didn't get. One of the things I think is to, to, to speak to this question about working abroad is that I do think it's sometimes it's hard for people to quite get what you've done. Mm. Um, I, I don't know, whatever. People knew what I was doing, I guess. But you're not there. You're not in the middle of what's yeah. happening. So I interviewed for some jobs. And then um, the woman who I was dating at the time wanted to move to India to leave journalism and study textile design. And because it had been my idea to move to Abu Dhabi, I said, well, wherever you want to go next, we'll go. But I secretly was like thrilled not to be going home. I think mm. I felt like... I wasn't done with being abroad. I really liked running a a, a kind of editorial enterprise. Mm -hmm. I was in charge of the whole newspaper. Um, And so I got a job at an Indian magazine called The Caravan, which was sort of launched with the, launched about, I don't know, seven months or eight months before I moved there, launched very much with the idea of being, wanting to be the New Yorker of India. Mm. Um, And it was a very small magazine, editorially. It was had a, reasonable circulation of 20 or 30,000 copies in print, um, which for an Indian magazine is, like, not bad. Like, it's sort of, in in that time, like, a big Indian English language magazine would be, like, maybe 150,000 mm-hmm. copies. Um, no one's selling, like, millions of magazines in India, uh, in English at least. So, um, and I was basically there, like, the sort of senior most... Um, we all had very funny titles because the owner was called the editor. Who was the editor? Who was this guy the called editor? Aunt Noth. So his family was super interesting. This is a guy, very young, younger than me, had gone to sort of business school in India, had kind of gone to work for his family business, and his family were this kind of venerable magazine publishing family. They mostly published in Hindi and other Indian languages. Mm-hmm. And they, they're sort of, I don't know if specialism is the right word, but they were like, seen to be quite expert in kind of reaching like a non-metropolitan audience mm. so it's sort of like you partially because again and you know there's not like sophisticated anglophone readers but like um the, the the best-selling magazine which i think did sell like a million copies a week um was like once described to me by someone in the advertising industry it's like a magazine for rickshaw for auto rickshaw drivers mm-hmm. but like but like some they were really good at it mm-hmm. um and so this young guy goes to columbia to, to do a master's in international relations just because I think he's kind of curious about the world and you know, his family has money and he can afford to do this mm-hmm. and falls in love with American magazines when he's in New York and is like loves like the old New Republic and loves the New Yorker and loves the Atlantic and comes back to America to, to India and I think sort of says to his family look I you know uh, if you want me to come back into the family business this is what that's I want to do. great but I want to do this and so he, they take this 
title, Caravan, which had been the name of a kind of like literary magazine in the sort of sense of like it published like poetry and things like that, mm-hmm. like 50 years earlier, um, published by the family, and they sort of resuscitate it. Um, and it was very funny. It was a very Columbia Journalism School heavy operation mm-hmm. because um, Anant had gone to SEPA, not to the J School. But then you um, didn't go to Columbia. I didn't go to Columbia, but all of the like half the Indian writers. So, so, so my kind of nominal boss at Caravan, who was called Vinod Joes, uh, was from Kerala, had gone to Columbia. Um, we had like this guy called Christian Kaushik who came back from Columbia and joined the magazine kind of thing. Um, it, so yeah, it was weird. It was, it was, we had like a staff of like 10 people maybe. Mm-hmm. Um, it was a monthly magazine. I, what was this? What I mean, was it? Was it? Did it achieve its aim of being very much like kind of American style, or did it? Ha- did it develop into something else? No, I think it did. I mean, it. Um, it. I mean, I used to go around saying to people, and I still say to people, you know, oh, it's the New Yorker of India. If you, you know, factor in what that might mean, <laughs> um, it, it, we did. Um, you know, I don't know. It was. You know, we did. 10,000 word cover stories every month and they were like intensely reported and people would work on them for eight months and um, in hindsight it was a, like a kind of I mean it's still going um, but but it, for me my memory of it is that it was slightly insane that I just, I just sort of did everything mm. um, What was your official title? I think I was called senior editor but I mean the sort of sense of it was that uh, I think I would be what in an American mag, like at the New Yorker, I you know you'd say the sort of executive editor or something like mm-hmm. that. Um, so I edited most of the long features, and then I was responsible for sort of like, you know, like the books editor would like call me up every month and be like, okay, here I'm thinking of you know mm-hmm. we, we might assign this essay to this person kind of thing. Um, so I supervised the books editor and the arts editor and the front of the book editor and all of this kind of stuff, and it was amazing. I mean, it was like. Um, this goes back to sort of this question of being abroad. And it was, in Abu Dhabi, I think, I very much felt like I'm commissioning all these writers from New York, really, to write for this funny Middle Eastern newspaper. I'm commissioning writers from the Middle East and also a lot of writers from India, too. And it's very much like, it's kind of early days of reading this stuff online, maybe. You know, like in, the, in Abu Dhabi days, the big, like, the, the equivalent of, like, viral success was to be on Arts and Letters Daily. Um, I don't know if you remember that mm. website, which still exists. It was just, like, three links every day to, like, a story. And if we, if we had a piece on Arts and Letters Daily, it would be, like, the most popular piece in the newspaper that week. Um, uh, in India, it was, you know, you were doing an Indian magazine for an Indian audience. And what was it like doing that as a non-Indian, yeah. as an American? I guess it... I probably shouldn't say this. I think people... It's, like, not as hard as people thought, I guess. Everyone was... People are very easily impressed, I think, by, like... You know, you study up on something a little bit, and then everyone is very much like, "Wow, I can't believe you know all this stuff." And you know, I'm like, "Well, I work here; it's my job. I have to know it." <laughs> um, I guess I think that it was like, I don't. I mean, this is obviously a relevant question to a degree for me now too. I, 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 I feel like it's maybe it's easy to make too much of the idea that you sort of see the country through fresh eyes if you're mm. not from around there. But I do think, as an editor, especially. I think in a way, like as a journalist, as a writer, it's probably quite detrimental to not be from a place, or it, it's, it increases the degree of difficulty substantially. Mm-hmm. I think as an editor, there is a bit of an advantage in that you see the journalism everyone else is doing as kind of like you don't take it for granted as like, oh, this is the natural way we do things. Mm-hmm. And one of my like theories, I think, is that journalism is a kind of very artificial practice just in that it's much more subjective and performative and all of these things. You know, it's not as, it's not, it's not like a naturalistic scientific enterprise. But I think if you're an English person who's lived in London your whole life and you've only ever read British newspapers and watched the BBC and so on and so forth, you kind of assume that like, uh, well, yeah, our journalism just kind of represents reality the way it is, and this is the way we do journalism. And it's sort of anything that might be weird or unusual or, or out, out of kilter with that is kind of you don't notice it so much. And I think mm. when you come to a new country as a foreigner and you're meant to be editing a magazine or editing the long read section of a newspaper, 
immediately, and for me, some of it is just like, oh, how's this different from America? But I think immediately you think like, oh, that's weird. Mm. Why, you know, so like the joke I always tell is that I, I sort of brought the profile to India, which was like a thing that, I mean, it's meant to be a slightly self-deprecating joke that like before Caravan, the like New Yorker style profile mm. where you write 10,000 words about someone and you interview 40 people who mm. they know, no one had done that. So it's, I mean, this sort of the, 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 I think I gave you a link to this, the first Caravan piece that was really like a big deal with Indian readers was a profile of the sitting prime minister, mm. which just no one had done. And it was, you know, he's in the newspaper every day, he's in magazines. India had weekly news magazines on a kind of Time Newsweek kind of level, but at no point were they, and written by this guy Vinod, who was my boss, um, at no point did anyone say, well, let's go find the economists. You know, so Manmohan Singh, who was then the prime minister, was famous because he had been the finance minister at the time of the sort of India's big bang, so to speak, mm. the 1991 financial reforms. And no one had interviewed the economists who worked for him during this time. So I was like, that's a total no-brainer. If you were yeah. doing an American magazine profile, you would do all of this kind of stuff. Or you'd go read clips and you find that, you know. Anyway, so I do think, so that's the thing. I think when you come in as a foreigner to a place, you, you see what's, not everything that's not being done, but you, it's easier to be like, oh, I see, we can just do this because this is a thing that people want to do. So by this stage, you've been out of um, the US for six years? Yeah, coming on seven, yeah. Coming on seven. So, so what's next? Where do you go next? Then I went back. Um, and I don't, India was hard to leave. Um, and I think, I'm sure everyone who lives abroad for a long period of time has their own version of this. I think you get to a point where you have a kind of basically normal life. Um, and you think, okay, well, I could carry on doing this sort of indefinitely. Mm. But if I don't want to do that, probably I should go. Mm -hmm. it's a, it's, I used to say to people, it's like, it wasn't if, but when, you know, or rather it was if or when, it, mm -hmm. well, how am I going to do this? It wasn't when, it was if. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> sorry. Uh, we got there. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I decided to go back to New York. I went back to work at the New Yorker. Did you um, know, that? did you have that job sort of lined up before you? No, went? no, no. In fact, um, I was back, I mean, again, it's all of the pivot points in my life involve David Remnick's office. Um, I was back in New York interviewing for another job and I had gone to see David to ask him to recommend to, if I could, he could be a reference for this other mm -hmm. job and he sort of said wait hang on have you got this other job yet and I said no that's why I'm coming to ask you to be my mm -hmm. reference and he was like hang on and he ran out of his office and came back we didn't run but came back and said you know I think we might have something here uh and so then I became the news editor of the website, um, which was a time of like great flux because the idea of doing the New Yorker on the web was still being worked out. Mm. Um, and my job essentially became commissioning kind of like foreign dispatches. I mean, I edited lots of different things, but the main thing that I did was to try to, I guess, kind of do, they were almost like foreign features. Most of them were 1,500 to 2,500 words. Um, it's a bit of, I guess a bit of sort of like, sometimes you see like the New York Times opinion section will do this kind of thing of like, okay, well, you know, um, a big thing has happened in Pakistan. You know, I happen to know a prominent Pakistani novelist who can write about it. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, you know, when Ariel Sharon died, I got a Palestinian writer, Roger Hada, to write a sort of memoir of, you know, his life with Ariel Sharon kind of stuff. Um, it was an interesting time to be back in America because... When was it? So this is like eight months in 2013 and 2014, so not for very long. It was really short. Really short. So um, did you get headhunted to come to the to the Guardian? 
Yeah, I had met Alan Rusbridger when I was still in India working at Caravan and given him, I was summoned to meet him um, while he was visiting by someone who, you know, he was there talking to people about the Indian media and was curious and someone I knew knew someone he was traveling with and said, you know, you should meet this guy. There's a weird American guy who edits a funny Indian magazine. Right? <laughs> um, and um, in hindsight now, what I understand to be the case is that Alan had this idea to do something like the long read, to do the long read. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think the details were really fleshed out. Um, I think he perceived that the digital newspaper was moving in a kind of like very accelerated direction where, I mean, it's a thing that you hear from people everywhere that, you know, the medium-sized news article is a kind of relic of the past. I don't know if people still go around saying that, but they certainly did for a while. Um, so and Alan was like, you know, said when we first met that, you know, he was thinking of the newspaper in terms of almost like a, between, a division between fast and slow, mm -hmm. which could mean short and long, but primarily, you know, was better thought of in kind of fast and slow terms. Um, I think that essentially he had the idea for this maybe thought at the beginning that this would just sort of organically, you know, the kind of the long pieces that were being produced within The Guardian would would make their way to this sort of place. It seems to me that at some point it was decided, okay, no, we need like an actual editor to do this um, who has experience with this kind of... I mean, I think in a way, literally they wanted an American. Mm -hmm. um, in the sense that this is this this is where the genre is. Yeah. Um, maybe not. I don't know. Anyway, so yeah, he called me up and said. And was it a case of you literally sort of coming over and and, and setting up shop, setting yeah. up this new um, arena? What was that like? Was there a, like was there sort of huge appetite for it in in the I newspaper? I heard your first editorial memo was longer than the story that was submitted. Yes, that's true. Can we, can we fact check that point? That's. I think it was probably about the same length. And Ian Jack bless him, um, complained about it. Um, I was ner I think I was a bit nervous and felt like I really needed to kind of... At the beginning, it was... Um, well, it was a lot to take in, I guess. I mean, I think that the... Um, my recollection of the very early days was like that most of my time was spent trying to explain to people what we were going to do. Um, usually either explicitly or implicitly in response to someone saying, well, how is it going to be different from like X, Y, Z thing that's already at the Guardian? Mm -hmm. um, and what was your pitch? Well, it was really a mess, I think, actually, because I think it, it's, it, it, it's quite hard to explain in a way. I mean, it's sort of... I, I, I think I was kept saying things to people about how, you know, these were going to be sort of pieces that sort of stood up on their own rather than being part of like a broader kind of new, you know, I, I've i spared you most of them, but I used to have a kind of vast storehouse of, of kind of faulty analogies and metaphors. And so one I remember from this time was saying that like, the, you know, a week's worth of The Guardian, think of as like a, as like a steel bridge that has, you know, 500 individual <laughs> beams that are all interlocked with one another. And each news story is like one of, or each, even each feature is like one of these beams. Who's the man jumping off the bridge? Yeah, no, so, and, 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 and all the beams kind of go together, and if I gave you like one beam by itself, like if I took a 600 word news story from page eight and mm. cut it out and gave it to you, you'd be like, what is this? You know, but like all together, it's like, well, that's your week, you know? And I was like, whereas like the long read is like three big trees. <laughs> <laughs> this is terrible. And each... Where are they in relation to the river? Well, the river. yeah, maybe they're on the bank or maybe, I don't know, maybe like you could lie them down and cross the river on them. I don't, but, but the idea was like, but this is a thing I don't, I mean, I've done this now. I mean, if, if, if you count when I started as a fact checker, which is, I suppose, my beginning or, or, or around the beginning of my career and like the in and around the like long form business or whatever we call it. 
Um, that's like 13, 14 years. And I don't think I'm any better than I was... Maybe I am. I don't know. I'm certainly better at editing, but I'm not any better at explaining what it is that like makes one of these people... Like, wh what, what are the kind of necessary criteria for something like this? Um, I, it, it's... You know, they're just like various different ways of failing to describe the thing. Because if you once you see it, it all of a sudden it makes perfect sense. And I, and I think the um, the you know another line I used to use with people was this sense that like the 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 if you think about newspaper features, it's like. Um, it's like a, it's like a, I don't know, like a pizza pie or something like that. And there's this, you know, you've got like a circle or a pie chart. And, and out there in the world this week, there are, you know, 20 trends or new movies or all these things. Things are happening out there. Um, and we're going to try and cover most of them, you know, with an, and, and very much the sense of coverage, I think, actually is a useful word. Um, we, we will have done our job. If, if most of what's out there kind of comes under our net. Mm -hmm. um, and you almost need a piece of paper for this, but my sort of counterpoint to this was almost like, well, imagine you start at like the center of this little pie, and every time there's something interesting at the edges, you sort of draw a line to the edge. Once it's interesting enough to like write a whole piece about it. Over the course of a year, if you have 150 of those little sort of radius lines coming out from the center, it starts to look like a whole circle because, like, you haven't done... You know, it, I mean, it's a good... The New Yorker is always a good stand-in for this, right? If you did nothing but read a year's worth of The New Yorker, you would have, like, a pretty good sense of what happened in the given year. There, there will be individual things that you didn't read about because The New Yorker didn't write stories about them. But, like, part of being a commissioning editor or being an editor in this kind of thing is, like, this faith that, like, it's okay for us to only do something when there's, like, enough there that we think it justifies a whole story. Mm. I feel like I might regret uh, my next question, bearing in mind your, uh, your taste for pizzas oh, yeah, and yeah. bridges and trees, but could you um, define kind of American style uh, journalism versus British style and, what, and, and, and talk a little bit about oh, yeah. them in relation to each other? Well, luckily I have a theory already prepared for this. Um, <laughs> My theory is that the best way to understand this, and I, I should preface this by saying that I've, done, I've done no research to see whether there's any validity to my theory, but the theory that I have is that geographically, you start with America as a place that has 30 big cities, 25 big cities, whatever you want to call it. And in each one of these big cities, by the like, mid to late 20th century, the like this like golden age of like we're sort of like vaguely pre-Watergate, post-war American journalism, pretty much each big city has like one mega newspaper. Um, in those days there are still competitors that the that the big papers haven't yet wiped out. Um, but they I mean it's quite clear in hindsight that the big papers have this like monopoly zeal. The Washington Post is determined to destroy I think it was called the Washington Star. It was like an evening newspaper that was one of its competitors. So in each one of these cities you have this big newspaper. I think it's a bit of a myth. There's a myth, I think, I don't know, maybe it's true, that, that the, the kind of objectivity ethos in American journalism was because then you could sell advertising to both sides. Mm. Um, whereas in the you know, 1890s or 1900s or whatever, you had like a Democrat paper and a Republican paper in every town. Anyways, you have these big monopoly newspapers. So the Boston, it's the Boston Globe. It's the Philadelphia Inquirer in Philadelphia. Obviously, it's the New York Times in New York. It is the Chicago Tribune, Atlanta Journal, the Atlanta, yeah, the you know Houston Chronicle, Miami Herald, and as you two might know, you know in the glory days, these were like great newspapers. The Philadelphia Inquirer, the Miami Herald were like famous for their mm -hmm. investigative work for kind of what we maybe would think of now as long form. And at each of these American newspapers, I think the presiding or whatever the like the prevailing value was. You know, so the, the, the main point here, I suppose, by contrast to England, is that you have no competition. So if there's a big story in Boston, only the Boston Globe is going to write it. I mean, this is a bit of an exaggeration because there are tabloids in these places, but like, it's a big story in New York, the Times is going to write it. If there's a big story in Philadelphia, the Inquirer is going to get it. So what you get in these places is like this kind of very patient, thorough, 
neutral, accurate, double, triple checked thing, and no style. I think in American newspapers, there is meant to be no style. And in the, you know, something I do know to be true is that in the kind of early days of what we now think of as like American narrative journalism, one branch of it, the non-New Yorker branch, which is like the New York Herald Tribune to New York Magazine branch. So it's Tom Wolfe, it's Gay Talese, Clay Felker is like the great editor. But, you know, Gay Talese says, I left the New York Times because it was like, I couldn't, I couldn't have a voice, mm. you know. So what ends up happening in America is that these writers gravitate to magazines because magazines are about this voice, they're about this longer form of storytelling. Mm -hmm. And my theory is that because a magazine, I think in many of these cases, I don't know what like the periodicity of Esquire in the 70s was, but it's like, I'm guessing it comes out once a month. You then get to a point where as an editor, you're like, okay, we're gonna put out 12 magazines a year. Each magazine is gonna have like, I don't know, we've got Feature Well, it's gonna have like three stories in it, four stories in it. They better be fucking good stories yeah. if you're gonna publish four of them every month. And I think that whole narrative that I've just sketched out for you is, 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 in my head at least, maybe it's all made up, is the sort of genealogy of how the kind of American long form magazine article comes to be a kind of like, well, these are like little miniature books that, that get published in this way. And you get within the fraternity, and I, in those days and still very much a fraternity, of, of magazine editors, then the competition becomes like, how perfect can you make the little tiny book mm -hmm. that you, you know, the sort of, you know, sense in which, like, if a story is not just right down to the very last thing, then, you know, you put it off another month or you spike it or, mm -hmm. you know. So that whole kind of thing, it's like almost like a little mini film studio kind of approach. And I think in England, well, it's, I mean, you guys know this better than me, but I think it, it's, to the extent that this journalism exists, it happens in weekend newspapers. There's loads of competition. A lot of it is about, well, like, who was in the news this week? Can we get them in the Saturday paper? It just evolves in a very different way. Mm -hmm. Do you see... Um, it's a good answer. Yeah, that was a good answer. It's sort of shifted, shifting a little bit, but is editing a, a better career than being a writer? I think it must be. Um, I mean, I, I guess it depends. Yeah, yeah, I think so. I mean, I think... Um, it's very hard to have a career as a magazine writer, I think. Um, is that because of pay or...? It's just a fair few magazines now, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, I, a big thing that has changed since I was a young person is that um, this universe that I'm describing of, you know, like where these people were who I was commissioning when I was in Abu Dhabi, I think very much there was a, you could reasonably expect, I think, back then, that um, if you were pretty good and you worked hard and you got a lot of clips and you got published in the right places, that like eventually you would, someone would put you on staff or you would get a contract. But I mean, even, you know, New Yorker writers aren't employed by the New Yorker. They're on staff, con they're on contracts. They have to, last I heard, they have, they have to buy their own health insurance. Although there's a slightly barbaric American thing happening there that's maybe <laughs> carried over here. Um, so yeah, I think it, I think it is. Um, I, I guess it's less, must be less fun to be an editor than to be a writer. I don't really know. Um, but yeah, I suppose that you get to a point where you think, and I guess it's, it's, you, well, I mean, I suppose the downside of it is that you have to come to an office every day. And I totally. suspect a lot of people who are, who are writers feel that it's like a, a slightly intolerable thing. And you, I guess, you, you, the older I get, the more that I feel like negotiating the institution is a big part of the job. Mm. That not that, I mean, all institutions are complicated in their own ways, but that, you know, a lot of what you, well, I feel like when I was very young, you know, when I was like an intern at The Nation, I feel like I looked around and I was like, oh, I could do those jobs, like of the editors. I'm smart. I read. I know what I'm doing. I know, what, I know what's good. I know what's bad. But this sort of sense in which like, well, like what do you do when there's like a crisis or like when something goes really horribly wrong or, you know, I don't know you get sued or all these kind of things that sort of actually the, the, the one kind of tax you're paying as an editor in exchange for kind of having your stable, safe career mm. is that like you have to spend, you have to deal with a lot of this stuff. Yeah. And, and on the whole, you know, 
the way it sort of works. Could you talk a bit about the process you have at the Long Reach Shop of the Guardian, just the, you know, the making of the sausage? How yeah. It, how it works, who's doing it? Well, so I think it's an interesting concept because uh, there are other people who do, who do things a bit like this, I guess. But I mean, it's sort of right. Traditionally, this kind of thing has been done largely in a magazine. And, you know, I think one way to think about the long read, it's like it's if you took a little bit, if you took a feature well out of the middle of the magazine and it just stood by itself. And then to confuse matters further, you didn't publish all the pieces at the same time. You did, you know, one on Tuesday and one on Thursday and mm. one on Friday. Um, there are three editors, so that's myself, Claire Longrig, and David Wolf. Um, we kind of all commission collectively, so each of us has writers who we work with, and uh, you know I think everyone feels free hypothetically to say you know if you're in conversation with like one of our regular writers to say you know. They come to you with an idea, and you know Sam Knight says, "I want to do this." I can. I'm allowed to say yes. You can do that. I don't have to go consult with everyone else. But in practice, I think we try as much as possible to talk about all the ideas together. Mm -hmm. um, and because I guess I think that the what I mean commissioning is 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 the key bit, really. I mean the the something I think you know that has started to make sense inside The Guardian in a way that when I was first here and trying to explain it didn't carry over to people is that, you know, what's the, the real defining element of these pieces is not their length, but their scarcity. So they're sort of, we're the only part of the newspaper, you know, different parts do different things, but, you know, that, that it's just, we only have to do three things every week. Um, now, we could be quite lazy and do three shit things every week, but, you know, it's kind of built into the package that each thing is going to be special in its own mm tree-like way. Um, so we all commission together. Uh, I think usually once a piece is commissioned, often, one thing that we've done more recently, I think, is, to, is, is in a way to kind of drag out the commissioning process, which I'm sure is not very fun for writers, to say, like, someone sends us a pit. If there's a writer we've never met or we haven't worked with, we get a pitch, we like the pitch, usually we will have the person, if they're in London, come in for a meeting, or get on the phone, a sort of conversation with the person about like, how do you think this is gonna go? What's your, what's your idea for like, how are you gonna do this, basically? I mean, I think there's a way of like, I said to people for a long time that it was like, you know, okay, what, like, what does it say on the outside of the tin is like the pitch, but then it's like, well, what happens inside the tin? You know, like, it's 5,000 words here. What's going to happen in, 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 in these 5,000 words? Um, so what we now sometimes do, or often do almost, is to say to people, like, okay, we've had this meeting, we've talked through the piece, go off and kind of, like, don't have to do any reporting, but, like, give us, like, an outline of, like, how you see this going. Mm -hmm. um, and we're quite formulaic, I suppose, in this. And sort of Simon's been through this, you know, sort of... we four or five sections, you know. I want to know what happens in section three, you know. What is the rhythm of the kind of the ideal, you know, Guardian long form piece? Well, so I think it really depends because I think you... It's very funny, there's like... I wouldn't say that we do like kinds of pieces, but but in a way there's, there's sort of like family resemblances. Um, so I think like there is a kind of piece that we do, and I think actually not too many other people do this kind of piece so much. The New Yorker a bit does it with the critics at large pieces. Um, ours tend to be a bit more reported, but you know, um, a lot of Andy Beckett's pieces are like this. Um, yeah, Sam Knight Sandwich's piece to a degree is like this, although it's maybe sui generis and hard to hard to say. But it's kind of it's almost a sort of it's a little bit of a kind of intellectual history of something. Um, and, and it tends to be, you know, so Andy did a piece about, you know, tabloids and politics. Um, and I think in that kind of piece, the uh, uh, beginning is very much about getting the reader to sort of like close their eyes and open them again or like look for the first time again at some sort of social, cultural, political thing that we kind of take for granted or 
uh, it's a kind of trend or a kind of intellectual current that we all know is happening, but no one has said like, you know, holy shit, look at that. Um, I have a joke that I, you know, point out the window when meeting with writers and say, look over there. Um, you know, something's happening. Um, and so having, I know, yeah, it would work better if this <laughs> listener was in the room. Um, so you, I think in those pieces, start with that and then you basically say, okay, well, like, how did we get here? What's the, what's the, you know. And how many edits would it go through? It's so hard to say. I mean, I think maximum speed for us probably now is three, is my guess. I mean, it's sort of someone who we work with a lot. It's like, okay, first draft comes in. Let me back up for a second. If the outline stage has happened, sometimes we commission a piece before the outline, sometimes we commission a piece after the outline. Depending on who the writer is or what they're doing, often we'll have another meeting or even two meetings during the like reporting maybe pre-writing phase. So Sam, you know, we don't do a lot of outlines or whatever, but like Sam will come in three or four times as he's reporting a piece and we'll talk through, you know, well, what's what do you think is the shape of it? What, what should we, you know, we kind of do, talk it out. The draft comes in, often I think with writers we work with a lot, the best thing to do is just have a meeting then and mm-hmm. say, okay, let's sit down and ideally two of us will read it. So, you know, one person will be the sort of primary editor and then Claire or if I'm the primary editor, Claire or David will give it a read and give me some feedback. Um, and then you sit down with the writer and usually it's like, usually the first edit is, is the big one and you are saying, okay, well, this beginning is all wrong and, you know, we can't end here and why is section three only 200 words and section four is 2,000 words and I don't know what the timeline is here the chronology is all a mess you know whatever 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 um, the first edit tends to be the big edit and then the second edit you know if gets you close enough then I mean to me it's kind of like a thing one of the things I think is very different about working in a newspaper is that you have to put the thing out three times a week and we're a really small staff and so in a way, if the old American magazine model is sort of like, okay, you're like polishing these things to like near perfection, uh, I think we do that more than anyone else in England, but I think we don't do it to the degree that an American magazine does it. And so at a point you're like, okay, how do we get, is, is this thing within, are we like close enough to the finish line that if I put it on the schedule for Thursday, you know, Tuesday night and Wednesday, we can go through the final things. And this is something we, we always ask, but what do you pay? It depends on the writer. Um, I think the standard piece, I would say, is probably about 3,000 pounds, maybe, for mm-hmm. 5,000, 4,500 words. But this is one of these things, I mean, it's a bit tricky. I think we've paid people less. We certainly pay people more. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I mean, I think you, if you're doing this kind of, commissioning it's not that much money for a lot of work right? yeah well yeah it depends I mean I suppose it depends on the person and it depends on what the piece is in a way I mean how long would it, would it typically take a, a writer to report and write one of these well stories? it's hard to say so it's I mean sometimes it's like you could do it in two weeks and mm-hmm. sometimes you, it's going to take you seven months or something mm. um, I mean I think that the um, as an editor with the finances, you have relation. You you have you have different kinds of relationships with people. So there's some people who you have a relationship with, where you essentially want to employ them full time, but you have to negotiate somehow with them how that's going to be workable because we can't really pay quite enough mm. for someone to live on full time. It's the sort of the the you know I, I have a theory that this enterprise is is based a bit on kind of surplus, right? The whole point of this genre is that you could have done it quicker and you could have done it shorter and you could have done it for less money. But if you had done all these things, it wouldn't be nearly as good mm. and it wouldn't be the special, unique thing that you've made it. Um, that logic is deeply unwelcome in the newspaper industry, I think mm. it's safe to say. Um, I, mean, I think we're very lucky because the 
accounting department of The Guardian understands what we do and why we do it and why it's important to the newspaper. But I think it's a very tricky thing because you end up... I don't know, you know, we just did a piece with an American magazine writer who is a staff writer at a magazine in America, and he's someone I've known for a long time. I used to commission him when I lived in Abu Dhabi. Um, And the sort of understanding I have with him is that uh, when he has a piece that isn't quite right for his day job, but he'd like to do it, and he's interested in telling the story, and he'd like to make a little bit of extra money, uh, then we do it. Mm -hmm. But that then becomes a negotiation between him and I that's like, okay, well, you're doing this because you're into it. It's a kind of passion project, but you're a professional magazine writer. You're not an idiot. You're not, I'm, I'm not going to give you a thousand pounds to do a 6,000 word story mm. in your spare time. So then it's a bit like we have a little bit of back and forth and it's like, okay, well, you know, what would it take to be worth it for you? How much is too much for me? And just moving on again, what, yeah. what is the traffic like that your pieces get? Um, it depends. I mean, I think some of them, you know, Sam's famous piece about what happens when the queen dies is like three and a half million page views maybe four million now um you know the piece we published yesterday by mark o'connell about why silicon valley billionaires are buying apocalypse bunkers in new zealand is more than half a million now Um, is that something that informs you as you commission pieces i know editors hate that question but is it yeah i mean No and yes. I think that we don't think of it as the measure of whether a piece was good or not. Mm. And there are pieces any of us could tell you that we think are like among the best things we've done that had shit traffic. And does it affect your um, standing with The Guardian? I th- well, so I think the thing is, to, to going back a bit to the beginning, once we got this thing up and running, mm. I think without anyone saying it to me, the, the sort of two or three kind of like quiet questions on everyone's mind were, is this really going to be good? You know, is it going to be noticeably better than what we're already doing? Um, are people going to click on these pieces? And are people going to read them? Uh, and we have, you know, sophisticated metrics for how long everybody spends we're reading something. That, yeah, yeah. We'll come to that in a second. Mm-hmm. Um, and then kind of like, can it work? Is, it, is, it, is this a sustainable thing? Can we do these pieces every week? Can, you know, will we'll adding the long read to The Guardian mean that you know well we need the police reporter to do a piece but you know Jonathan's got him off doing something for three months kind of thing so I think once the powers that be saw that it basically worked and people liked reading it and it was bringing you know kind of positive attention to the paper the kind of individual traffic for each piece started to matter a bit less I mean there's definitely a time in my like first year where like I was like you know, shitting myself every day about, you know, is this piece going to get more traffic? How are we mm. going to do, you know, if 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 we don't have enough traffic, is someone going to come to me in a year and say, you know, sorry, pal, no one likes this. What are um, the metrics that still matter to you? I think now it's just more like do people think it's good, really. Mm. I mean, it's very, like, I, it's, it's, it feels great to have a piece that does big traffic. I mean, it's like a, but it's, I think very quickly you learn that, like, is the contingencies are massive. Mm. And, like, even, you don't even have to learn this. It's like the number of page views that the piece has literally is about whether people click on it before they've seen it. So it can't be about whether it's good or not. You know, it's not like a movie where it like, gets reviews. Time on page, though? Time on page. I think what we've learned with time on page is that there's some pieces that will never have a lot of time on page. Mm. And so, like, any essentially any true crime piece has, like, insane time on page. Um, and we do some of those, and we've done them very well. Um, a piece that's, like, an essay about some, like, you know, what is neoliberalism, um, <laughs> which I think is one of our best pieces... A lot of people click on that and they get one sentence in, or they get a paragraph in and they leave. Mm. And it's, but I, I, what I've learned about attention time is that I can't worry too much about that. Mm. I think, but it's a funny thing because it's like once the metrics are there, you know, we had a piece um, by another writer who I've known for a long time, who's written for me at various publications and also writes for the New Yorker, and and it's he started this piece with a very. New Yorker kind of opening, very anecdotal, mm. you know, um, you know, Simon is, you know, 
<laughs> sitting at a table in an office in this city, and he has he's wearing this suit, and this is what he looks like. And David was just like, everyone's going to close the window. Like, you can't, like, that's, we can't start pieces like that. Um, so I think it's like we know, but it doesn't, it's funny, it doesn't change our way of doing things. You know what I mean? It's kind of like, I think a good way to think about this is like, we all know that like, we might make more or less money based on what we do, and we might feel good about making a lot of money from having done something, but we don't do things solely for the purpose of kind of making it's not, money. It's not all pandas and abortion. Yeah, although it's an amazing thing, like the sort of the what pandas you mean? Mm. <laughs> yeah, the, if you if, if one was, we we should wrap this, but if one was solely chasing traffic, surely. Well, no, see, this is a funny thing. It's like the, pan, that pandas piece had 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 relatively low traffic. This is like David and I have a rolling argument about, and David and Claire and I all have a rolling argument about why we think animal pieces don't do as well as we would expect them to do. My theory is that when the animal pieces involve humans then they do very well. So we did a great piece about the, like, the, like, the, the great war of man versus rat. That was like wildly <laughs> successful. But then we did a piece that like David and I really liked by like a young American writer about bee thieves, right? That sounds great. People are like going around in California stealing bees because all of a sudden bees are very valuable, I think, because you need them to pollinate almonds or something. Mm. Very anyway, we should. Yeah, we, sorry, we, we're conscious of time, but it's a final swift question. Please, yes. Um, it is maybe above your pay grade, but can the Guardian remain free? Yeah, it looks that way. I mean, I think that um, everyone is moving toward reader support. I think the right way to understand this, and it, I don't think it's a conversation that is done in a terribly sophisticated way in this country, is that uh, the New York Times and the Washington Post are essentially still voluntary in a way, but it's difficult if you don't want to pay. Mm. So it's, I'm pretty sure that if you're crafty, you could read the New York Times as much as you want without ever giving them a penny, and it'll probably be a bit, 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 bit of a pain for you. Um, but I think a lot of people who have taken out subscriptions to the New York Times, you know, especially since Trump or whatever, mm. aren't doing it in a kind of transactional way where, you know, I'm giving you money so I can get this product in the same way that I buy milk at the grocery store. They're doing it because they're like, I want to support this. And yes, I get something in return. So the Guardian, I would say, is doing an extreme version of that, basically, which is saying, look, we all pretty much know that someone's got to pay for this. Um, and so far, it's working. Uh, whether it will continue to work forever, who knows? That's a, a very hopeful note yeah. on, on which Well, end. it's kind of, it's, you know, it's one of these things that actually I said, like, Every, every time I have to talk about long form like this, someone says, is this sustainable uh, financially, you know, as the news business is doing so badly? And I think if it's a matter of like reader, reader support is the direction we're going in, that's really good for this kind of work because this is work that makes its value really clear. Mm. And so people like, you know, it makes, it makes, it might not make, the Guardian more appealing to advertisers, um, or the New Yorker more appealing to advertisers, or whatever the publication may be, but it definitely makes it more appealing to readers, and if those readers then want to give you money, then the new model is like better, I think, in some ways. Jonathan, thank you so much for your time. Thank you, And for, for, for talking us through trees and, and bridges. Yes, I'm sorry, I carry on a bit, but <laughs> it's been fun. It's fascinating. Thank, thank you. you very much. Very good, thanks, guys. Now for a swift update from our lives, Simon. Um, what have I been doing? I've been and reading. In, and reading, yeah. Uh, I've been in Belgium uh, to do a magazine story about the Belgian football team, which is interesting. Uh, and the weather was good, and it was nice to be in Brussels, which is a city I know. Uh, I'm now back writing that up. Uh, I have been reading. I finished the book that Cassie was very rude about, uh, and I'm now reading a book by Norman Dixon called On the Psychology of Military Incompetence, which is a very celebrated volume from the 70s. But I'm down to my last five books that I need to read for my book. Cassia, what about you? I am um, still going through the, the edits of my own book, which is, you know, good fun, and it's, I'm really looking forward to seeing the cover art and, and doing all that kind of um, fun stuff. Um, I mean, I'm mostly reading that, to be honest, and, and also going back over my, my source notes um, just to make sure I've got everything uh, right and going back indeed to my sources and chatting to them about updates because some of them I haven't spoken to for, for 18 months. That's been the sort of majority of my time. So 
busy week for both of us. Uh, this has been, as ever, Always Take Notes, hosted by me, Simon Acom. And me, Cassie Sinclair. Our producers are Liz Davies, Ed Kiernan and Olivia Krellin. Our music is by Jess Danheiser. Zara Hankier looks after our social media. And James Edgar designed our logo and did some of our other graphic design. And you can find us on all manner of social media. We're on Facebook and Instagram at Always Take Notes. We're on Twitter at Take Notes Always. And our website is alwaystakenotes.com. And of course, do please leave us a review on iTunes. Thank you to those who have already done so. It really helps and we love hearing what you think. Bye.